Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to this session on integrating sustainability and climate change content in your course or program. My name is Oliver Lane. I'm the manager for teaching and learning at the UBC Sustainability Hub, which used to be called the Sustainability Initiative. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to let you know that we'll be recording this session so that it can be shared uh, with others on and off campus. This is what CTLT uh, usually does with its programming. If you prefer not to be recorded, uh, we invite you to turn off your camera, your video. Um, if you're okay with being recorded, feel free to turn your video on. It's also always nice to see some, uh, some faces, uh, but only if you're comfortable uh, to do so. And if you're having lunch, it's totally fine if you wanna be eating while you're enjoying the session. I think we prefer to see faces than no faces. Um, so th the goal of this session uh, today is to leave you inspired and encouraged to incorporate and enhance sustainability and climate change teaching and content. Um, maybe you're thinking about this for the first time, or maybe you've already been doing some of this work. Uh, in either case, we hope you, we can offer some ideas and some insights and some connections to support the work that you're doing or wanting to do. Um, so we'll be hearing from some faculty members that work with us at the Sustainability Hub uh, about their experience in engaging with sustainability and climate change education and about specifically some of the projects that they've taken on in the last year or two. Um, and uh, we'll be having a space as well for discussion with you and take your quest to take your questions and, and your, your, your experience and your comments as well. Um, I'm curious to know, so from all of you here, maybe I'd like to know who has already teaching climate change or sustainability in any way in their, in their practice and who is totally new to this. So maybe, maybe you can choose any emoji except the one that raises your hand, just any emoji to say, if you have been teaching in any way climate change, have engaged on climate change and sustainability, just choose an emoji and let us know just to get a sense. So good, a good mix, a good mix of um, new to this field, and people who have already been teaching or at least experimenting with this. Um, so I'm joining this call today from Muskim unceded traditional and ancestral lands. And I invite you to share in the, in the chat whose lands you're joining us from. Um, there are a number of resources available online to learn more about this. Nativeland.ca is one of them that uh, I recommend, native-land.ca. You can find uh, whose lands you're on um, and feel free to share in the chat. Um, where are you joining from? Uh, I was at my wife's UBC graduation ceremony last Thursday, celebrating a very important achievement uh, for her and for the family as a whole. And we were reminded in one of the speeches there at the event uh, about the privilege that we have of, um, of having access to higher education and above all, the privilege of having access to education in this place, in this space, on this beautiful land. Um, and we were invited to reflect on the responsibility that comes with that privilege. Um, my wife and I arrived here in what, what is called Vancouver 14 years ago um, as master's students at UBC. And we're now raising a family and building our lives here. Um, and over this time, we've tried in very imperfectly to better understand the history of the people who have been here in this region for millennia as stewards and knowledge keepers of this land. So if, if you are, like me, an uninvited guest uh, that's arrived here at some point in your life, um, I encourage you, if you're not doing that yet, to take, that, take on that journey to, of, of learning and listening and understanding um, the history uh, and take on the responsibility to support justice for Indigenous peoples and ultimately for all future generations. And, and this concept is very much connected to the work that we want to discuss today about sustainability and climate change education, um, which ultimately has the goal of making sure that all the students that graduate from this institution and go out into society are equipped and uh, empowered to be agents of change for a better and more uh, just world for everyone. So I hope you can uh, join that journey. So before I introduce you to the panelists um, and we start with that conversation, I very quickly wanted to provide some context of where this work is coming from um, and the sustainability hub where, where I'm, who I'm part of. Um, so, and, and we'll also go through an agenda. For, so I'll, I'll briefly run through the agenda so that you know how the, how the session is divided. And then I'll talk about the sustainability hub very briefly. 
So we'll have um, a panel discussion where we have uh, four faculty members and a student who will be sharing their thoughts on why this work is important and what they think the role of universities is in supporting uh, climate change and sustainability education. Then we'll hear from the faculty members who are working on specific projects, um, developing curriculum, and we'll hear from them their story of how they engage with this and how it's going and what worked and what didn't work and how they're solving any issues that might come up. There'll be time for a, a few questions from you if you're interested in asking a question through the chat on any about any of those projects. And then we'll break out into small groups and that will be an opportunity for, they will be facilitated by our faculty members and that will be an opportunity for you to share why you think this is important. What is the journey that you were on? Um, what are the challenges that you might be encountering or how do you get started? Answering all those types of questions through, through a conversation. And we'll end the session with uh, some reflections from the different groups and hopefully send you off inspired into the world uh, to do more of this good work. So I was gonna say uh, about the sustainability hub that was formerly called the Sustainability Initiative, which is a unit that I'm part of. Um, our mission is to inspire people to act upon the planet's most urgent challenges through UBC's academic and operational sustainability leadership. And so to do that, we, there are a number of things that we engage with. And one of the main things is that we connect faculty, students, staff, departments, and teams to each other. We create those spaces for conversations and for learning. We curate and facilitate events, conversations. Um, we do a lot of our work in partnership with other groups on and off campus as well to integrate sustainability themes into teaching, learning, research, and international engagement. And specifically, and this might be of most interest to you, when, we, when it comes to working with faculty, we provide support through curriculum development grants, uh, teaching resources, we create spaces for meaningful connections to happen. And one of the, those programs actually is the sustainability um, sorry, Sustainability Fellows Program. And our four faculty members who will be on the panel today and presenting today are Sustainability Fellows. Um, and that's a program that basically has a group of between 10 and 15 faculty members meeting every month to discuss their projects, to uh, engage with guest, uh, guest speakers on certain, certain um, that have certain expertise, and basically learn from each other and exchange ideas. So that's roughly what the Sustainability Fellows Program is. And that is, and I'll mention this towards the end, this is open to, to faculty across campus. So I think with that, I'll pass it over to our panelists. I want to very briefly introduce you to Delaney Austin, who is a student at UBC is in her fifth year doing a dual program in the, in the integrated sciences and also in First Nations and Indigenous Studies. Um, she'll be on the panel with us. We also have uh, now our sustainability fellows, Dr. Kerry Renwick from the uh, Department of Curriculum and Pedagogy, uh, Dr. Sylvia Bartolic from the Department of Sociology, uh, Dr. Maggie Lowe from the School of Community and Regional Planning, and uh, Dr. Rob Kozak, Dean of the Faculty of Forestry. So I'm gonna pass it over um, to you. I'm gonna get started. I think Carrie will probably uh, get us started. The questions that we have here is, are, why is the, this work that you're doing important to you? And what is the role of universities uh, when it comes to sustainability and climate education? And feel free to uh, add questions in the chat. We, we might have time to address those now or, or we might come to addressing them um, later on in the session. Uh, over to you, Kerry. Thank you, Oliver. Um, welcome, everyone. It's lovely to see so much interest um, in what I think is such an important area. Um, for me, in terms of responding to Oliver's um, questions about why I think this area of work's important, is without wanting to date myself too much, um, I read Silent Spring as a child and it had quite a profound effect on me. Um, and certainly the way in which I engage with my work, it's relational. Um, I have a background in uh, partially in biology, so relational relationships and interrelationships for me with those sorts of notions and idea are inevitable. So for me, um, 
I'm looking for ways in which Western universities um, can respond to the challenge, particularly about global warming, sustainability, um, in a way that they haven't done previously. Um, cast in a Western view of the world um, in linear fashions that we through capitalism, we take what we need and don't think um, what the long-term consequences are is problematic for me. And so notions and idea about engaging with sustainability, about living in a world with limited resources and not stealing um, the world and the land from our children are important motivations for me for engaging in this project. Um, and when I chat a little bit later with the project that um, I'm working with Sylvia Bartolik with, um, you'll see the, the, some of the things that are guiding um, the work that we're engaging with and that we're trying to do. My interest started with a student. I had a student do an honours paper on fast fashion, and this is not something that any of our courses in the family studies area or the family sociology area actually talked about. So, you know, we, we talked about family resources and all kinds of other things, but we didn't actually talk about value systems and the complex choices that people make in their everyday lives. And so um, Carrie's going to present her project and you'll see how that sort of um, parallels what we do in our project. Um, but this is where it started for me thinking about, well, how do we get individual people on board? And it's not just convincing the one person, but it's conv convincing their whole social circle to perform differently or try different things. And it's also complicated by socioeconomic status and all, all these other factors. So that was really my um, starting point, just really getting interested in what are the dilemmas around these choices we make in our everyday lives. And I'll stop there and let someone else talk. Thanks. And, and Hello, everyone, and it's great to see uh, such a great crowd here. Um, I feel under pressure. Those were such terrific answers. Um, but I'll just add to this by saying that, to me, um, sustainability is, is an ethical concept. It's, it's like justice or, or fairness, you know, you know, which says that things in the future, you know, should be better than they are at, at present. And, and uh, you know, I think that's a legacy that we need to leave for our, our, our students. But I also see it as a, a way of thinking, a, like a, a skill set. Um, so in many ways, it's like numeracy or, or literacy. It just needs to sort of, you know, transcend all of our courses and all of our educational offerings. Um, and one of the, the key messages, I think, um, you know, based on some of the work that, that, that we're doing here in the Faculty of Forestry is, you know, we need to better understand that delicate balance between the environment and, and society. And, and, and the important role, I think, that, um, and Carrie touched on this, that, that consumption plays in, in a post-material world. And, you know, th this is becoming increasingly difficult, I, I think, where, you know, in a world where virtually every trajectory uh, points to this neoliberal ideal of amassing individual wealth. Um, and so we need to, as much as possible, bend away from that curve, those sort of atomizing forces um, uh, to look more holistically at community-based solutions, um, really bold and innovative and imaginative solutions. And I think our education and, and our institution really need to reflect that, that sort of ethos. So perhaps I'll stop there. Thank you. So I think to me, climate and sustainability education uh, can kind of be seen as a strategy for coping with climate anxiety and as a precursor to the climate action that I think we know um, needs to happen to contribute to just and sustainable futures. Um, and growing up, kind of maybe being the youngest one in the room, uh, I grew up with a lot of eco-anxiety. I had farmers in my family uh, who were really stressed about climate change and the rain. I always, it was always about the rain and whether they were going to have it and what that was going to mean for their livelihoods. Um, and I didn't really understand. And I saw these really sad photos of polar bears and, and things like that. And it was just really a bombardment of that. Um, and I became really obsessed with recycling because I thought that was the solution to this like climate problem. Uh, and then in high school and university, I've been really fortunate to have these learning opportunities um, where I think I was really able to reduce my anxiety um, and feel a sense of empowerment through understanding that there's a need for this collective action. It's not only my responsible as an responsibility as an individual, but it's definitely part of my responsibility. And that there are these like really wonderful networks, especially beyond the community 
or beyond the university within communities that you can tap into to be doing this work. Um, and I also think that um, in university is when I started to learn a lot about what it means to build a just future um, and knowing as a settler that my ancestors were involved in creating this climate of colonization and capitalism that now leaves us in the place that we're in today. Um, I think just really motivated me to know that I have a responsibility to do better for future generations and also for my current um, generations and peers. Wow, so powerful. Anybody else want to share the comments? Maggie? Sure. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, to my fellow panelists. Those were very um, yeah, powerful um, insights. And welcome, everyone. It is really lovely to see uh, so many of you here. Um, I, think, I think for me, um, kind of what Delaney said about a, a sense of responsibility kind of, kind of hit home. Um, I, I do feel a, a huge sense of responsibility working in um, like a privileged institution uh, and colonial institution like UBC to really put uh, time and effort um, and passion towards, um, you know, how do we contribute to a, a more equitable and just world. Um, and for me, it's been a, a real journey. I started my degree, I started kind of my trajectory uh, to where I am now in, in the field of environmental studies. And uh, even before that in high school, I, you know, I was kind of a nerdy like camp kid and loved being outdoors and um, knew even in high school that I wanted to study um, environmental studies. And at first I thought it would maybe the science biology group, but quickly realized I was actually more interested in kind of policy and governance. And I've kind of followed that trajectory. I was in environmental studies and then um, environmental science and then environmental studies. And to just watch the, the, the way we understand, um, uh, at least in Western worldview, the, the problems that we're facing, um, as particularly around sustainability and uh, climate change, to kind of be part of these conversations and follow it for a long time um, and be and to care about it. I just, yeah, I just feel this like very, um, the sense of, of responsibility um to to stay attuned to it and um yeah and being in I mean get I'll go on this um a little bit more later on but being connected to folks that feel similarly um and can help us understand these problems in like the various um uh facets of the of the problems um is just really helpful um and hopeful Maggie, do you feel that like you, you'd like to maybe get started with uh, sharing about your project? Yeah, thank you so much. So um, I have the great opportunity today to uh, just very quickly talk about the project that I've been involved, when, involved in the last two years through the Sustainability Fellows Program. And I, the name of the project was Sustainability Education at UBC, What Can We Learn from Participatory Urban and Indigenous Planning? And I was part of a wonderful team, um, including Allison Earl, um, Ildi Kovacs, who's a PhD candidate and a GRA on the, on the project, and then a, a collaborator in the Faculty of Education, Rob Van Weinsberg. Um, next slide, please, Oliver. So really quick overview of, of our project. We collaborated with Rob Van Weinsberg um, to think about how we could expand, help expand the sustainability curriculum for pre-service teacher candidates um, in the Faculty of Education and specifically students in the sustainability cohort of the teacher education program. And the idea was to enable teacher candidates by communicating the importance of participatory, uh, democratic, and indigenous planning in education um, for sustainability. And uh, so to do this, we put together four related sustainability-oriented modules to be used in fourth year a fourth year class for pre-service teachers. But we quickly realized that these um, sustainability modules um, could be used to support sustainability curriculum um, potentially in other disciplines or other units across UBC. And we did have a chance to kind of test that, these modules in um, uh, specifically the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture curriculum. So next slide, please. So I won't get into too much of the details of the, the uh, modules themselves, but we had one taught by me um, in Indigenous Community Planning, another on um, participatory planning with children and youth that was taught by Ildi Kovacs, 
Tactical Urbanism by Alison Earle, and then another module about around systems thinking. And happy to go into details of, of these modules um, later. Um, but just to say that the way they were structured was the each of us taught a three hour, essentially a three hour workshop on these topics in an existing course. And often we would try to order the modules in a particular way. So I would start, I would start my module first, and then um, we'd have Ildi come in the next week to do hers on participatory planning, Alice in the following week. And then the, the systems thinking module would go either um, before or after um, our three. So next slide, Oliver. And this is just a really quick rundown over the last two years where and how these modules have been taught. So um, in various courses in education and in landscape architecture. Um, and you'll notice that we were able to design these uh, modules both, well, we were in a way uh, had to design these modules um, both for online um, and for in-class um, uh, teaching which was, I would say, a really valuable, while challenging, very valuable experience uh, over the last two years. And then next slide. And so very quickly, just a couple lessons. So th these photos are from the very last um, module that I um, facilitated in an outdoor class, which was very different from one of us, you know, starting from the first modules um, with online and everyone was new to it in Zoom, Zoom land. Um, but we originally had hoped and thought that the modules would kind of easily be able to be um, adapted to, to um, go into many different courses fairly easily. But of course, realizing that um, a lot of time and energy needs to go into adapting each module to fit um, you know, the students and the course content and the instructor um, each time that it is taught. Um, next slide, please. Uh, another interesting observation we made was there's quite a, a high level of, um, I would say, kind of anxiety within students that, um, that change from the first year to the second year. It was expressed through um, feedback that we received um, after a few after a few of the modules um, had been given. And so, um, yeah, interesting insights around how in the first year, I think the importance and what we were trying to get across seemed to land quite well with, with many of the students. And in the second year, that was a bit more varied. And we did receive more feedback around students kind of questioning the relevance of, of what we were teaching. And so that was some really um, important feedback for us um, to consider. And then just the, the last slide, um, Lastly, one of the biggest um, learnings um, was, or I mean, uh, privileges of doing this work was the working uh, with this project team and being able to learn from um, other folks doing and teaching about sustainability in various uh, ways in other parts of the university. So getting, getting to work with um, Rob Ilby and Allison was, was a great pleasure. And I will, I will leave it with, I'll leave it there and pass it on to my other um, fabulous panelists to talk about their projects. Maggie, have you had any, any tips for anybody who would want to get started on, on this kind of work? Faculty members who just arrived at UBC, let's say, um, what would you, what would you share? Some um, this, this might be the low hanging fruit, but there are amazing resources at the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology. <laughs> So just by even being in these workshops or checking out um, some of the uh, incredible uh, resources that are there was a huge help to me um, my first year, uh, my first year here. And also in the Indigenous Initiatives workshops um, are fantastic. Ready to move on. Thank you, Maggie. Um, we move on, moving on to uh, Rob's project. What I missed saying at the beginning before Maggie started was that the three projects that we are uh, sharing with you today are part um, or were partly supported by the by a grant that we offer at the sustainability hub uh, an interdisciplinary education grant and as i said additionally um, the fact these faculty members are also um, sustainability fellows within within the sustainability hub okay so uh rob we're ready to go i have your first slide up great Thanks, thanks, Oliver. Um, yeah, so unlike Maggie's presentation, um, this this project is fairly nascent. We, we just got started on it uh, 
last September. Um, let, let me just start by saying I'm really happy to be part of the, the Sustainability Scholars Program. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, and it would, if anyone is interested in this program, I would definitely recommend it. It's just a great opportunity to um, sit down pretty casually and have some great conversations with, with uh, you know, a group of peers who are passionate about sustainability and, and climate change and so forth. So um, definitely highly recommended. Um, so I'm going to talk about our project, which, as I said, is fairly nascent. Um, I should say that um, Stephen Shepard, who many of you might know, is, is the leader on this project, and I'm very much riding on his coattails. Um, but he's on holiday, so so I'm I'm going to be presenting this. So if I misrepresent this, I'm, I'm I, I do apologize. Stephen's truly the, the leader on this project, but we've got a number of folks involved. Aliza Kuhn, um, who's the project coordinator, uh, Jorn Detmer, who's in the Center for Advanced Wood Processing, uh, Owen Croy, who is um, an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Forestry and um, an urban forester in the city of Surrey and Jorma Neuvenen, who's our Assistant Dean of uh, Professional Programs. Um, and, and so our project is called uh, Climate Hacks in the Community, a field course on community engagement. Uh, next slide, please. And, you know, it's built around an alarmingly simple notion of, you know, affecting meaningful and, and tangible change uh, with respect to adapting to and, and mitigating against a, a warming planet. Uh, by doing alarmingly simple things, uh, you know, at the scale of, of local communities. And so our, our project goal is, is to develop an interdisciplinary field course uh, where urban forestry and wood product students uh, work together with local residents and youth to design and install what we are calling uh, climate hacks. And, and so just a little bit of background here. Forestry is an inherently uh, interdisciplinary faculty, but, but we had two programs that didn't really interact at all, uh, urban forestry and wood products processing. And, and so one of the many motivations behind this project was to create a, an interdisciplinary space for these two quite disparate groups of students to, to come together and work on an interesting project. And the, the project that we devised was this thing around climate hacks. Um, so next slide, please. Yeah, so a climate hack just refers to small climate action projects to tackle um, the climate emergency in people's own neighborhoods. Uh, next slide. And so, you know, these are just, when we refer to climate hacks, we're, we're talking about really simple nature-based actions and activities that can be taken at a community level, you know, which when aggregated truly can have, um, you know, truly are effective tools for, for climate mitigation and adaptation. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. And so really simple examples like tree planting, which has impacts on uh, cooling cities, stormwater reduction, carbon sequestration, and other ecosystem services, planter boxes uh, for local foods and pollinators, uh, shaded benches for um, gathering places and cooling, uh, other shaded, other simple shade structures and screens uh, for cooling and, and growing local foods lawn conversion uh, for uh, leaf litter retention to reduce water and fertilizer use, or the creation of signage to uh, identify local climate actions. Next slide, please. Um, so in this particular course, so again, we're, we're going after these fairly simple community-based community climate solutions, but we have four kind of overarching experiential learning objectives. Um, the key one being for students to develop skills in community engagement. So it's really a, a social goal, if you will. Um, but the other three um, are around appreciating the value of interdisciplinary collaboration. Again, we're bringing two quite disparate groups together here. Uh, understand how to implement climate action solutions at the community level um, and applying student subject skills in the real world. So we see this as, as you know, in the end, it's about um, students as agents of change uh, within the communities, doing what they can. Next slide. Um, so the course structure, as we've mapped it out thus far, again, let me remind you that this is a fairly, uh, it's fairly early days here. Uh, but the idea is that we would have two groups of students working on two 
community projects, at least for the sort of pilot running of this course. Um, and the course itself will be covered in, or, or will be offered over both the fall and the spring term, um, and will comprise four distinct activities. Um, first, initial workshops for kind of intensive learning, so that's the sort of classroom-based stuff, but um, the second part will be field work, and this is where students meet neighborhood champions and residents. They assess sites, they they look at built precedents, uh, they uh, co-develop plans with the communities, and then ultimately they implement the projects. Uh, the third component will be mentoring by uh, instructors and, and professionals, both in the fields of wood science and, and urban forestry. And the fourth component is a, a final report, which documents the process and evaluates um, the the uh, outcomes of, of the project. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the plan timeline, uh, we are currently in phase one, um, again, just starting. So that would be developing and preparing the course package and uh, coming up with our partnership arrangements and recruiting our students. Um, over the next uh, year or so, uh, well, we will be delivering the pilot course as a directed study uh, starting in September. Uh, running all next year. Uh, phase three would be the evaluation of, of those courses. Uh, we'll tinker, make improvements to the courses, and the uh, with the ultimate aim of um, finalizing the course offering, uh, which is to say having a Senate-approved course um, for uh, not this academic year, but next academic year. Next slide, please. So in terms of our progress to date, uh, we have met and consulted with the program directors from each of those two programs. Um, the idea being uh, we wanted to figure out if there was room um, and elective freedom in each of the programs, if it made sort of pedagogical sense to have a course like this. Um, and, and so we worked with our program directors on that. Um, and we also worked with them to identify students who uh, had both the credit room and the interest in, in doing this course. And so uh, the goal was to identify eight interested students, four from each program for the pilot uh, course. Uh, it says four students signed up so far. Actually, the, the update is that we've got all eight students signed up now, so we're, we're, we're good to go. Um, an important part of this project, the sort of discovery phase, if you will, was uh, to identify community partners um, and so what we're doing there is we're re leveraging relationships that we fostered through our collaborative uh, for advanced landscape planning's uh, Cool Hood Champs program, which seeks to empower local citizens um, to take climate action through a series of uh, DIY activities. Um, and we're also, and this is an important part of the course, we're also identifying organizations um, for this, this project to supply the materials. Um, hopefully we all know that trees and, and, and wood are one of nature's most effective tools for, for sequestering carbon and, and combating climate change. So an important aspect of this course was that we not use more trees uh, than we have to in our built um, solutions. So we've partnered with the Vancouver Parks Board um, to use urban trees that needed to be felled either because of uh, illness or age or safety concerns. And we're also working with an organi organization called Unbuilders who uh, demolish homes and, and resell the wood components. Um, so we're using recycled wood or wood that would have been diverted to a landfill or burnt. Um, and then currently we're also uh, developing our syllabus and, and our uh, final schedule. Um, so that's, I think, all I've got to say about our program. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rob. Uh, what if I was going to ask you about how you're building those relationships with organizations in the in the community, but you you sort of explained that with partnerships that already existed, and it's definitely a very important aspect of the project. Um, yeah, and, and the key aim of, of the project is to have students engage in 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 um, with with communities and and work with communities and co-develop sort of questions with communities and solutions. That that really is our our, our, our motivating uh, learning outcome, if you will. Okay, thank you. Any any questions from uh, the audience?
for Rob. I know there's a question, uh, sort of a delayed question for Maggie. Uh, I will read that out in a minute. But anything you'd like to ask Rob? Um, Christina is asking, do you need to get approvals from cities for any of these projects? Uh, probably. <laughs> Um, but I, I think um, in, in general, we will see um, the extent of the project. If, if it's a large scale project, then yes, we would, we would need approvals. It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. But we are working closely with the city on this project, so they're fully aware of what, what we're doing. Uh, while people think about questions for Rob, I'll go back to a question for Maggie from Chloe. How did you and your team balance the theory and practice of the four themes or domains around which you developed the modules? Thanks, thanks Oliver, and thanks Chloe. I was just, uh, for your question, and I was just kind of typing a, a quick answer, oh, but one of, the, one of the ways that we did do that was um, to kind of balance theory and practice, and given that each of the modules were kind of in a three hour, I would say workshop type format, um, we did have a structure where each module did have pre-required um, readings or podcasts or videos. Um, we tried to limit that to like one or two um, that we would ask each, we would ask the students to do a week before the module. And that provided kind of the foundations and some of the theory part. And then each module did have um, more of an interactive piece built into it that would, um, kind of allow for um, putting the theory in, into practice as best as possible. So a quick example of that is I gave a pre-reading around um, uh, from Musqueam authors around what community planning looks like for indigenous planning looks like for Musqueam. And then during the module, we actually did a tour of the Musqueam um, house posts on campus um, and had really great discussion um, kind of connecting like why we at UBC um, you know, it's it's important for us to understand the house posts and connect to that to to planning concepts. Um, so, and I would say all all four modules we kind of put that um, into practice, and we got better at it as we as we went along. So we'll move on to the next presentation. But if you do have questions for the previous presentations, uh, don't be shy. Please share them in in the in the chat, and we'll read them out uh, later. So I'm going to pass it over to Carrie, right? Correct, thank you, Oliver. Sylvia and I share an interest in families and how they work and function together. But one of the delights of being involved with this project is um, we were asked to create a partnership, um, a connection across two different faculties. Um, and for me, that's one of the very positive bits of this program in that um, we are encouraged to move beyond um, the immediacy of our own work and to seek out colleagues and like-minded partners in other areas. And so that's an incredibly powerful thing to do. Oliver, if you can skip through um, the next one, through to the third slide, that would be great. Because what I'd like to do is to then quickly um, provide an overview of the purpose and the, some of the context of, or content that we're actually looking at in what we're trying to generate. So the, the ideas that um, Sylvia and I have worked together on is looking at the practices that exist within um, human ecology, uh, what exists in terms of the everyday living decisions that are made in context of family. And so what we are interested in doing is looking at how sustainability is both impacted by um, and can be created within context of um, the base unit of society, which is family in each and every one of its forms. And so what we're interested in doing is, is working with students to build an understanding and appreciation of sustainability that exists in context of what we do within our everyday lives. So um, Oliver, if you'd like to go to the next one, um, like Rob's project, we're also only just at the end of our first year. Um, and looking back, it's been an interesting journey as we've solidified our ideas and thinking around what we intended in our proposal and what's actually emerging from it. But there was a um, two areas that we particularly agreed on is that we needed a theoretical core, but we also wanted to have courses 
uh, that were very much experiential, that actually gave people not only understandings about sustainability in, in everyday thinking, but also how they might go about it. So one of the things that we're working to at the moment is developing up four courses, um, one which, which has family and sustainability as a theoretical base and a required um, course that we're looking at. And then we're developing, or we have developed up three other courses, one that looks at family and sustainable food, family and sustainable clothing and family and sustainable resources. And the focus of those, like I suggested, are going to be very much hands-on. Because we are also working towards a certificate of family and sustainability, um, we're moving to include electives um, that work towards, um, that also include three credits, and there are a number of pre-existing courses um, that allow that connection between family and everyday decisions that we're able to draw from. Um, and so at the moment, what we're working through is we've got the um, penultimate drafts of our four core course or key courses, and we're now working through to actually get those accredited before we then trial those next year. Oliver, if you'd like to take us to the next slide, please. One, one of the things that we did in our planning was to map out what we saw as program objectives and then to look at what our course objectives were. And then in the third bit, to make sure that each one of the program objectives are reflected in each of the four course objectives that we're actually um, developing. So that we wanted to make sure that if our program objectives were core um, that guided the way in which we thought, then it was important to have each of those expressed um, through different medium, if you will, through resources, food or clothing uh, in each of the courses. So while you may not see the detail there, um, you can see that we've actually tried to work very, very hard to make sure that there is coherence between the program objectives that we're working at together with how we're expressing those through individual courses. Um, Oliver, if you can skip the next slide, um, because what I'd like to do is just quickly show you some examples of um, assessments that we're working with for each of the four units we're developing. So in the first one with family and sustainability, we're setting up a multimodal project that draws on Rothenberg's um, theories around um, ecology, but particularly how it works and fits within context of family. And so what we're asking people to do is to to look at the theory, but then to, to explore ways by which it influences um, not only um, choices that are made, but also how available resources impact on families, both from a social justice point of view, as well as different um, areas of um, social and economic um, standing. In the next slide, um, there's an example of an assessment that fits for the food um, sustainability program. And in this one, it's encouraging people to have a closer understanding of current, if you like, food and sustainability practices within context of family, whatever shape or form that family might be. But then to also invite deeper understandings of circular food systems rather than linear ones, and then to move on to the ideas about how they might shift and change um, family practices around food so that they do reflect much more sustainable and much more circular food systems within context of that family. So to acknowledge that it's an ongoing process, it's a learning process, it's an evolving process over time as people come to understand the way in which they work and the decisions that they make in the everyday around food. In the next one, um, we're pulling, uh, we're looking at one of the assessments from the fashion um, course, and it's around fashion fast fashion dilemmas. And so there are a number of challenges in and around fast fashion. And you can see the bullet points there that actually highlight seven of those. And so what students are invited to do is to select one of those challenges, and then to think about what does it mean in their everyday lives, what it means around their choices about fashion, and to think of ways in which they might help the fashion industry um, to, um, to move away from fast fashion by, in some ways, um, through their own demands, their own expectations and their impact as consumers about what that might mean. And in the last one, looking at families and use of available resources, 
Sorry, Oliver, if you'd like to move to the next one. Thank you. Um, in this one, we're inviting students to engage in an upcycle challenge and reflection. And there is a part of um, notion of um, understanding that not every family or individual has equal access to resources. And so in this, um, students are invited to create an upcycled object from whatever they may have from within their own homes or um, that they'd like to restore. Um, the goal is to create um, something that's of a higher quality than the original one that they're working for. They have a budget to spend, they're invited to keep photographs of before and after and during the process, but the products uh, will be put up for sale and any of the money that would go would be re, um, raised from that would go to initially what's been identified as a downtown east side women's shelter or the group of students may um, elect another charity that they actually might like to donate to. But they are also invited to reflect on for whom um, their item, their upcycled item would be most valuable, um, and also how they might inspire other people um, to engage in upcycling processes. And so what we've just wanted to do today is to give you some tasting of the approach that um, Sylvia and I are taking um, in our courses um, to try and not only talk about it in a theorised way, but to actually encourage um, participants and our students to engage with it both in a collaborative, but also in a meaningful way within their everyday lives. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Kerry. That's wonderful. Um, um, I'm, I'm waiting to see if there are any questions in the <laughs> chat, but do you, do you, have, any, do you have any tips? Because this sounds like a lot of work. I'm wondering if you have any any tips for people who are faculty members who are thinking of developing something similar in their own disciplines. What are those Hire first steps? Students. <laughs> <laughs> Hire, Hire students. Hire students help. That's what we've been doing. We've been yeah. hiring help. Yep. To get yeah. it. The other thing is, whilst Sylvia and I have a shared um, interest in family. We don't have expertise across all of these areas. And so Sylvia's point about hiring students and colleagues to contribute that do have that expertise is actually very, very important. Um, and so while we've been able to work, for us working through the program objectives and the course objectives have been really important so that then when we've handed it over to others, to both negotiate those sorts of outcomes, but it's also provided us with um, a compass, if you like, to hold to what it is that we've seen as being important within this project. And so we're both very, very excited to be able to have the opportunity to um, actually de um, deliver two of them next year. So that's our intent at this stage. And obviously, mm -hmm. take feedback from our students that participate. Yes, it's some hard work, but I don't know any of our work that is any different. I think what's mm -hmm. made it e um, easier is we're both passionate about the content area but we're also committed to it and so whilst there's been some challenges around content and how we might express it there's been a pretty strong drive in the um, um and fueling our interest in this area hmm. thank you there's a question from christina yeah. how do you connect individual actions for example food waste fast fashion etc to broader systemic structures and practices since the issues yeah. as you noted on a slide earlier cross multiple levels yeah. Um, Sylvia might also want to add to this. In part, um, Broffenburner's model helps us work through some of those. But also, um, personally, I'm interested in um, donut economics, which looks at the notion idea about resources as finite um, and how we might use them in ways that um, actually are meaningful for not meaningful, that are useful for not depleting them, but being able to reuse, recycle them. Um, in food, that notion and idea about um, broader um, systems becomes really important. And I'm speaking to that because that's my area of expertise mm -hmm. in addition to family. Mm -hmm. um, Sylvia, your thoughts? So my thoughts are to, well, in sociology, we think about, you know, different structural problems, right? And so my goal for the students is to be careful not to shame people. Like we obviously want to have an impact in the, in a positive direction, but we, I really want them to see the broader um, rationale for why people make the choices they make. And some of those systemic contributions to, or limitations to people engaging in, you know, what we might consider positive behaviors. 
Um, and that's where this, you know, the Bronfman Brenner model really helps to look at how the individual interacts with different social structures and where there might be some blocks and limitations. Money is one of them, right? I mean, you know, people with lower socioeconomic status don't have the same opportunities as people with higher socioeconomic status to make these decisions in the same way. So we just, we don't wanna shame, we wanna inform and look at multiple perspectives and then try to come up with solutions in that way. Any other tips and tricks to getting started? What, what seems pretty evident to me is that partnering across disciplines opens a lot of doors and also shares, shares the load of work. So that seems to be right. a suggestion. Yeah. How, how did you form those, how did those partnerships start? How did you meet faculty from across disciplines? We We've wanted been to do thinking about a previous project. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we were working on a dual degree between fa the family studies minor and the home economics program. So that's how Carrie and I met. And then this kind of emerged through our discussions. And at Rob or Maggie, how did you form your partnerships? Good, good question. I was just thinking about that. Uh, the project kind of came revolved around um, Allison and I and it'll be all kind of knowing Rob, Rob Van Weinsberg um, and he kind of having this idea to bring, wanting to kind of bring planning into his, or aspects of, of urban and rural planning into the sustainability um, cohort curriculum. So he kind of he kind of brought us together and then which was which was absolutely wonderful because we we've had you know so much fun working on this uh, together and I've been able to learn from you know what's what's happening in, in landscape architecture as well as the faculty of education. Rob, do you want to yeah, I mean it, our our partnership is within the faculty, so we have a fairly small faculty, so we all know each other, so it's fairly easy that mm -hmm. way. But uh, I will say this: we have a really multifaceted faculty and, and um, work in all kinds of different directions from sort of natural sciences to social sciences. And a lot of us don't really get together. So I would as much as possible encourage that, that sort of interdisciplinarity, getting together with your colleagues, seeking out some common ground. And it's amazing what, what emerges. So Stephen and I have never well, we've worked a little bit together, but not much. But when we when we sort of started talking and figuring out what what it is that we could do um, as a team, this really these really great synergies emerged. And, and so, just get out there, talk to your colleagues, and, and see what happens. Okay, I have one one last question before we move into the small groups, and this is for all the panelists. Um, how did you negotiate teaching load and teacher credit with your own department of faculty? I, I'm a dean, so I negotiate with myself. <laughs> there you go. Good answer. Uh, I, I will say that that um, you know we, we look at these sorts of opportunities, these sorts of um, um, yeah these, these 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 opportunities to create and develop new and innovative and interdisciplinary courses as a, a very important thing that we should be doing as a faculty, and and so we do allocate uh, teaching load credit, if you will to these sorts of exercises of developing a, a, a new type of course. My teaching load didn't change. <laughs> so I didn't negotiate well, apparently. <laughs> At this stage, mine hasn't changed either, but I think when the courses come online um, and we're looking to teaching them, then um, I'll need a conversation with my department here. Okay. Yeah, similarly, similarly, I, um, the, the extra well yeah in addition to the the courses that i teach um per term that we taught the modules it was a couple extra classes that i would teach and yeah i i just just did it um and i think i, I also framed it around you know yeah that kind of service um work uh hmm. as well okay thank you thank you everyone for responding uh to those questions um, if you have any other pending questions, we can post them in the chat, or you can use the opportunity of the small group discussions as well to, to ask those questions. Um, so now uh, Elisa is going to help us with the next stage, which is the breakout rooms. I think all groups are back. I'm counting about 15 people. Yeah, there we go. So how did it go? 
any any thoughts was it terrible was there a good conversation any tips and tricks uh I just wanted to thank the people in my group. So I haven't introduced myself to others. I don't know how many other people we have here. It doesn't look like too many now, but um, my name is Tara Ivanochko. I'm uh, academic director of UBC Sustainability Hub. And so I had my own little breakout group that I was talking to. In our group, we talked a lot about um, an interest in having um, guest lecturers or people with, with uh, particular areas of expertise um available to come into the classroom and we have a program that allows that and has, has set that up with graduate students focused on climate change coming into classrooms but in this case um the interest was maybe even broader than that so um thinking about sustainability uh and bringing expertise in um to share between departments i think there was inspiration from this interdisciplinary education and uh, so that was one of the things that was discussed um we also talked about the interdepartmental climate emergency committees that have been working um both in their own areas and interconnecting to do some of that work themselves and particularly the resources that the library is providing to um to different departments uh to allow in particular asian studies to help them achieve their green day goals where they spend one day per week i think it was per week um focused on climate and that was the, either by working from home that day or by bringing in um, some topic into their class that has a climate focus and that might be challenging if you're in asian studies and you're doing um ancient historic um work and so the library was really useful in thinking about ways to bring that in um and and targeting climate uh, appropriately for the content area of those classrooms and then we discussed uh, briefly the importance of having um, strategic plans in place like the indigenous strategic plan to help drive change um, and I didn't get to finish my last comment in the class in the in the breakout room there that um, the climate action plan 2030 um, is another one of those that we have now at UBC that is hopefully going to be um, making a lot of uh, difference for how we can um, drive change um, that and of course what I was talking about was the groundswell of student um, uh, demand for action. So we had a great conversation. Thank you all in my group. Thank you, Tara. How about other groups? Anybody want to share? I, I can just quickly share. Um, and Tara, it sounds like you had such a, a great conversation in um, your group. Um, I think we did as well. It was it was a pleasure. Um, the um, I give a little shout out. There's somebody here attending uh, from the University of Manitoba. So it's fun to uh, to to talk about what's going on in, in different institutions. Um, so yeah, we covered a lot of different um, a lot of different topics. There's a little bit of um, idea sharing and information sharing around how um, potentially a faculty member might be able to get in touch with another group uh, that can support how curriculum can be brought into one of the assignments for for their classes. So that was really great. Um, good chats about um, how, you know, the need for change, there's these tensions around how, you know, I think we need to encourage people, encourage that change happens at the individual level and how, you know, the need for, for hope and agency um, and curating that, but also how we're all operating in these larger systems that we've inherited that are essentially creating, um, you know, the challenges that we're facing. So, um, yeah, lots of lots of great lots of great things shared, and it it is always nice to hear about what's going on in other um, institutions. So, thank you. Great, thank you, Maggie. I know there are two more groups. So, if I can jump in, Oliver, uh, we had a really great discussion as well, wide ranging, um, that went from. Uh, Thailand to Sweden to the Bay of Bengal. So thank you to my group for um, that exciting conversation. I, I would say there were two emergent themes um, in terms of kind of where we should move institutionally. The first very simple message, we need to break down the silos of the university, encouraging interdisciplinarity as much as possible. And, and um, we need a long-term vision for how we address these, these sorts of issues. So that, that came out loud and clear. Um, the other more specific thing, but I think important and something that's, that's worth putting on the table is, is we need to 
consider more robust and flexible ways of A, assigning teaching load, but B, um, promotion and tenure, the, the process of promotion and tenure. Um, you know, we're, we are beginning to include things like um, open education resources, uh, but we should, I think, encourage things like, um, you know, EDI and decolonization strategies in our courses, um, Indigenous knowledge, interdisciplinarity, and sustainability education. So those those types of considerations should be built into the uh, process of, of uh, tenure and promotion. Thank you. Thank you. Those are those are great points. Um, I know there's one group, but there's also one minute left in our session. Um, any final comments from that group or from anybody else? Our group had lots of the same ideas around breaking down the silos and mm -hmm. finding ways to be able to work into interdisciplinary without, um, you know, challenges with course codes and the ways people are paid and all of those things, but also just a big, um, we feel like the big, the big push for sustainability kind of lost ground because of COVID that we've started to focus on COVID and that we need to come back and focus you know, I know COVID was a big deal, but we need to now come back um, to some of the conversations and, and make this more of a, a focus across campus. Great. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, and, and in connection with that, just wanted to let you know that at the Sustainability Hub, we are planning starting in the fall to have a monthly, monthly sort of meeting space for faculty who are interested in having these conversations. So uh, stay in touch. You can, you can uh, sign up for our newsletter or contact me directly so that you know when these things are happening and also learn more about our grant programs, our Climate Teaching Connector, and other supports that we provide for, for the work that you do. So thanks, everyone. Thanks to our panelists. Uh, thank you to CTLT for hosting us. I know uh, Elisa was going to share. She just did uh, the survey. So please fill out the survey for CTLT so that they can continue to improve these wonderful institutes that they offer uh, to us. And please stay in touch. Again, reach out to me directly, sign up for our newsletter, um, and have a great, great, wonderful rest of your day.